when you look at the effect of diabetes uh, on fetal growth and development, I mean, it's a common uh, knowledge that diabetic mothers have large babies. Uh, conversely, if a baby is born that is particularly large, 8, 9, 10 pounds, I mean, sometimes it's automatically assumed the mother was diabetic. Uh, fetal macrosomy is the term applied for babies uh, which are born that are over 10 pounds. Uh, basically, the maternal hyperglycemia increases insulin uh, through the normal feedback mechanism secretion by the fetal pancreas. And as you know, uh, insulin is a type of growth uh, hormone, has a lot of growth hormone effects. Uh, another thing to remember is that diabetic mothers uh, have a very high incidence of giving uh, birth to babies with uh, anomalies or diabetic embryopathy. Uh, as we said before, the most crucial period is immediately post-fertilization and the two systems which are immediately the most sensitive for uh, uh, anomalous uh, development are the uh, cardiovascular and central nervous system. So diabetic mothers uh, have about a four or ten to tenfold increase uh, chance in uncontrolled diabetic mothers to have uh, babies that have heart or central nervous system defects and as you know the heart and central nervous system critical period is almost right after um, uh, fertilization. Um, oral agents, oral diabetic agents in themselves uh, are generally thought of as being teratogenic so it's very likely that a mother who is on them will uh, switch to insulin you know during the pregnancy. Uh, let's get some basic um, definitions here again. Uh, what is appropriate for gestational age? What is small and what is large? Well, it's a statistical definition. If you take all the babies that are born, if a baby is below the 10th percentile in weight, by definition, statistically, that's called small for gestational age. If you uh, look on the other end of that bell-shaped curve and go over 90%, that's large. And this not only applies for birth, it also applies for a preterm or gestation as well. And uh, because I've used the word preterm, the definition of the word preterm is a baby that's born before 37 weeks. It's a simple temporal definition. A post-term infant is an infant that's born after 42 weeks. So if a baby is born between 37 to 42 weeks, that's regarded as term. Before 37, preterm. After 42, post-term. So a baby that is born before 37 weeks is premature. Prematurity with congenital anomalies are the two overwhelming biggest causes of neonatal mortality. Prematurity itself uh, is probably a little bit behind congenital anomalies and overall, but it's not far behind. But it in itself has risk factors as well. So why are babies born prematurely? Well, here's the four main reasons. Uh, if the fetal membranes, amniotic membranes, rupture prematurely, PPROM, premature rupture of uh, fetal membranes, uh, that's uh, a sign that the baby will be born prematurely, no matter what the cause is of the premature rupture. Uh, generally, intrauteral infections uh, cause prematurity. Anatomic uh, physiologic anomalies of the uterus and cervix Placental anomalies are associated with prematurity and, of course, multiple gestation. Uh, twins, triplets, uh, generally the more babies you have in the box, the more likely they are to come out early. And uh, these are the main factors for prematurity. A infant who has fetal growth restriction is an infant that is born that's under 2,500 grams. That's how you make the diagnosis. You put the baby on the scale when he's born. If it's uh, less than 2,500 grams, you have diagnosis of fetal growth restriction. In the concept of a growth restriction, the babies are not uh, immature. They're just undergrown. 
In other words, their state of maturity is there. They're just uh, small size-wise. And this is, of course, related to small for gestational age as well. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of assessing it, ultrasound and, and whatnot. But if you think about it, there's basically going to be now three reasons for fetal growth restriction. It's going to be the baby's fault. It's going to be the placenta's fault. It's going to be the mother's fault. So there's three general categories for uh, FGR. On the fetal side, uh, chromosomal anomalies uh, is a good chunk, of about 17% of fetal growth restriction. Uh, fetal infections is um, probably much bigger, and the, the classic uh, intrauterine uh, infections are the so-called torch infections, with T standing for toxoplasmosis, O is other, R is rubella, C is cytomegalovirus, and H is herpes, so both of these are all three of these are viruses, Toxo is a parasite, and these are last two are in the herpes family, aren't they? So the torch infections are the main uh, cause uh, of fetal infections, which result in uh, fetal uh, growth restriction. In a baby that is born growth restricted, it's a symmetrical restriction, okay, if it's a fetal cause. In other words, uh, both the head and the trunk are proportionately uh, involved uh, equally. If on the other hand the growth restriction is due to a placental problem, vascular malformation, thrombosis, uh, uh, chromosomal, whatever, uh, the, uh, it'll be asymmetrical growth head and the, there'll be a relatively sparing of the head size and a relatively greater uh, decrease in the uh, body size. Uh, in the third category of FGR, we now have the mother as being the cause. We talked about the fetal causes, the placental causes. Now let's talk about the maternal causes. This is without a doubt the single greatest category. So, and the single greatest um, reason for a maternal fetal growth uh, restriction would be uh, preeclampsia hypertension. They're basically relate to each other because hypertension, proteinuria, that's part of preeclampsia. If the uh, preeclampsia actually goes into central nervous system symptoms like uh, convulsions, then that's no longer preeclampsia, is it? It's actually eclampsia. And on the other hand, we all know that uh, mothers that are alcoholics, mothers that take drugs, narcotics, cocaine, mothers that are heavy smoker, these are also uh, very, very, very common causes for maternal fetal growth restriction. And remember, these may not be single most powerful drugs producing growth restriction, but they certainly are the most common. And I'm sure we could make a list here of a whole bunch of other things, but these three things right here probably result in about 90 or so more percent of maternal reasons for FGR. And when you look at uh, organ immaturity in immature infants microscopically and try to relate them for the problems that they're having, and you take a look at these important organs <clears throat> like lungs, kidney, brain, and liver, for example, um, the single greatest problem with uh, lungs is that there's uh, in terms of being immature is that there's a deficiency of surfactants and we're going to go into that a little bit more when we talk about respiratory distress syndrome or what we call the old hyaline membrane disease and the alveoli differentiate mostly in the seventh month uh, and one of the main uh, things that causes alveoli to differentiate properly is surfactants so diseases of uh, Premature, immature infants that have pulmonary problems are almost always related to surfactant. In the kidneys, uh, there is improper uh, development of glomeruli, so it's basically a glomerular problem. Uh, when you have uh, babies that are born with central nervous system uh, immaturity, uh, there's problems with homeostasis of temperature and blood vessel vasomotor control. And of course, in the liver, uh, the liver being the primary organ for conjugating bilirubin, uh, an immature liver will result as a baby with hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice 
because an immature liver is one that has the inability to conjugate and excrete bilirubin. Okay, we're at the end of our uh, 600 second clip. We'll talk about something else in the next clip. Thank you very much.